for Tommy. This is our 16th annual Martin Luther King broadcast here at Beth Elohim. Uh, we used to be under known as the no, no Place for Hate Committee, and that was in 2000, and then eventually 2003 for his breakfast. I took over the breakfast in 2006 and been very fortunate to get some good speakers and have a great turnout. So this is this program is for you. Um, and so I just want to get going here. We do have to recognize some important people. In my opinion, all of, all of you are important. If it wasn't for uh, Donald Trump and all the control of chaos we have, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a credit to you for coming. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge a very faithful and supportive group here in town, the Active Police Force, please. Just as people for today, only for today, is the kitchen crew. <laughs> kitchen crew. Thank you very much. We are here. And uh, of course, we have our uh, representatives. We have our state senator Jamie Aldrich. Okay, where are you? Oh, Jen, hi, okay. Jen Benson. I'm going to move on. We have a welcoming, uh, our rabbi, our new rabbi here, Beth Elohim, was unable to attend to the previous engagement. And uh, we have uh, our cantor, Sarah Spire. Shalom. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and all that he worked for. I'm so glad to be here to welcome us all today to this wonderful community event and to Congregation Beth Elohim. And first of all, um, thank you to all who organized this event, as Sal mentioned. Sal mentioned some of the people, including Maase, the social action arm of our synagogue, the AB Diversity Coalition, and especially to Sal Lopez. I don't know where he just went. <laughs> Sal is really the man of the hour. He, he works passionately and tirelessly every year. If you know him, you know this to be true, so that we can come together as we are today. I'd like to share a few thoughts with you. In so many ways, no matter from which perspective you're looking at it, it seems that this world is in turmoil, and celebrating days like this, and remembering the teachings of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. are ways that we as a society express a collective intention to embody kindness, respect, and goodwill. These are the qualities that Reverend King embodied, as we know, and the qualities with which he approached and inspired humankind, built bridges between people, and created change in this world during his lifetime. This is a day where we renew our resolve to raise the bar on our common understanding of the kind of basic dignity and respect that each human being needs to offer to one another. So perhaps the best place to start is right here and right here. And we must know how to offer this kind of respect and dignity to ourselves. We are raised and live in a society and in a world where remembering our work, no matter the circumstances, can be difficult. But once we each internalize our own worth and dignity, I believe that it's only natural for us to extend the same kind of respect to one another. And part of that respect includes listening to and trying to understand many kinds of voices and views, even when they don't align with our own. No less, it includes remembering that a divine spark is found in every single human being, including all of us here. So over five decades ago, Reverend King said, I am convinced that the universe 
is under the control of a loving purpose, and that in the struggle for righteousness, man has cosmic companionship. Behind the harsh appearances of the world is a benign power. I found this quote to be quite inspiring. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, a Jewish, a Jewish theologian and philosopher who left Nazi Germany and came to America, knew Reverend King well. Rabbi Heschel and Reverend King first met in Chicago at the 1963 National Conference on Race and Religion. Heschel marched arm in arm with Reverend King from Selma to Montgomery, and he accompanied King to the Riverside Church pulpit for his address opposing the Vietnam War. Ten days before King's death, Heschel famously said, Where in America do we hear a voice like the voice of the prophets of Israel? Martin Luther King Jr. is a voice. He's a vision and a way. The whole future of America will depend on the impact and influence of Dr. King. We're glad that Renee Graham is here today to help us think about the state of the world right now in the light of Reverend King's holy voice and vision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. So, um, okay, our uh, person introducing our guest speaker is, in my eyes, an outstanding community leader, educator, a lecturer, and just a good, become a good friend. Roland Gibson. Thank you, Bill. Earlier I informed Renee that I had one mission in life today. It was to give her and you as much time as possible. So, those of you who know me, I have a script. And I'm honored. 248 years ago, 1776, a group of people created an experiment. That experiment had potential, but it also had a few flaws. For the last 242 years, we have all been living with and experiencing the results of those flaws. Over 2,000 years ago, a man named Plato offered a formula for addressing one of those flaws, injustice. He concluded, justice will only be achieved when those who do not suffer injustice feel the same outrage as those who do. For the past several years, I've had the good fortune to be in this room on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and I have never been disappointed. Today, Renee Graham is going to continue that tradition. She will invite us to think about one individual who was outraged, Martin Luther King Jr., and how we, as individuals and groups, can pay tribute to his legacy. It is a special honor for me to welcome Renee to the podium. Uh, I'd like to thank the congregation, Beth Gilleen, for inviting me. I'm, I'm really, really honored to be here. If I may, I'd like to get a quick clarification out of the way concerning a situation that still seems a little murky for a few people. Not necessarily in this room, but in general. So I humbly ask for just a few minutes of your patience and indulgence while I address it. Can you adjust mine, please? Yeah, I think yeah. I mean, will it stay? I don't know. Yeah. That's, 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 that's why it wasn't working. Just hold it. 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 Donald Trump is a racist. He does not say racially insensitive things. He says racist things because that is what racists do. He does not say racist things merely to appeal to his base, as we're often told. He says racist things because that is what racists do. 
He was racist decades before he became president. He was racist when he claimed Barack Obama was not born in America. He was racist when, on the first day of his campaign, he said Mexican immigrants were, quote, bringing crime, unquote, and were, quote, rapists, unquote. Calling Haiti, El Salvador, and African nations shithole countries isn't just unhelpful or very unfortunate, which is as close as Paul Ryan will ever come to denouncing his lord and master, Donald Trump. <laughs> unhelpful is a plow driver who traps your car in a mass of snow after you dig it out. <laughs> Trump's words, yet again, are vile and appalling. And that's when, what's very unfortunate is that too many people still refuse to see that the President of the United States is a racist. So, now I'm taking care of that. <laughs> Happy Martin Luther King Day. <laughs> and, and thank you for inviting me uh, to spend this special morning on what would have been uh, Dr. King's 89th birthday. I always say I grew up in a Martin Luther King household because we had a photo of Dr. King in our dining room. That's how it was in many black households in the 60s and 70s. For instance, when you walk into my Aunt Rose's apartment, the first thing you saw was her holy trinity in the hallway. King, John F. Kennedy, and Robert Kennedy. One friend's mom even had a painting of King and black Jesus. Afro and all, strutting like superheroes off to save the world. <laughs> but in my childhood home, among our many family photos, there was King in a gold frame alongside a newspaper clipping of his I Have a Dream speech. Because he looked a little like my father when I was very young, I thought he was some relative I didn't know. So I called him Uncle Martin. <laughs> then came April 4th, 1968. It was just after dinner time, and my mother was getting ready to serve dessert, which on that night was an ice cream cake to celebrate my father's birthday. I was five, watching TV and waiting for cake, when a bulletin interrupted the program, our family's festivities, and the world. My mother could see the word bulletin on the screen, but couldn't hear what the newsman was saying. She asked me what was happening, and before I could answer, I heard my grandmother scream. My father, his mouth agape, came running in from the bedroom. My mother walked from the kitchen to the living room and sank into a chair, her eyes wide and glassy. It was the first time I would see my parents cry. My Uncle Martin was dead. For years after King's assassination, his photo and speech remained in our dining room. As I got older, I would often read that speech, even as the newsprint yellowed, it became so fragile I feared it would disintegrate in its frame. One section in particular always stirred me. There were those who were asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. All these decades later, here's what I think when I read that passage. We have disgraced Dr. King's legacy by allowing so many of these issues to persist and deepen. <coughs> Police brutality, generational poverty, voter suppression. And yes, while there are no more explicit whites-only signs, there are still many barriers that keep people of color out of certain neighborhoods and schools that make them wary of driving while black, walking while black, shopping while black, or in short, basically existing while black. It's also a reminder that King and his allies weren't wrestling with some nagging cultural aberration, 
but a deliberate foundation of racial subjugation and white supremacy that is the birthmark of this nation. And that national scourge has always been unnervingly tenacious and is now emboldened with a home in the White House. That passage, which is less about a dream than the cold hard facts of a nation that has not kept its promise to all, also throws into sharp relief how much Dr. King and his message have been watered down. If you're on social media, your platform of choice today is likely filling up with all those familiar Kingisms. Darkness can now drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I call this refrigerator, market, refrigerator magnet Martin. <laughs> it's one of our great revolutionaries, reduced to morsels of easy listening wisdom. It's like Beethoven boiled down to nothing more than the first four notes of his fifth symphony. That's exactly what's happened to Dr. King since he was murdered almost 50 years ago. People pick over his bones, taking what's useful, leaving out context, and presenting the same few phrases over and over as if that sums up the man in full. Now he's a pocket-sized book of quotations, as digestible as a greeting card. He's an affirming pat on the back fashioned into a tweet. He's a main artery through the heart of black communities, still suffering today as they did in King's lifetime. That is unless they've already been gentrified into a footnote. He's a monument, a stamp, a plaque. He's a three-day weekend with appliance sales in his name. King has been parsed down to the point where even Republicans try to claim him as one of their own. In 2012, a conservative group bought billboards in black neighborhoods in Dallas, Houston, and Austin that said, Martin Luther King was a Republican. Vote Republican. <laughs> yeah, that didn't work. <laughs> Black voters didn't buy that mess for a second. <laughs> and they also found such statements deeply insulting and condescending. A 2006 essay titled Martin Luther King's Conservative Essay, excuse me, Martin Luther King's Conservative Legacy, written by a research associate at the Conservative Heritage Foundation, said that, quote, King's core beliefs, such as the power and necessity of faith-based association and self-government, based on absolute truth and moral law, are profoundly conservative. King, the writer said, had been appropriated by liberals. As if this was not absurd enough, she wrote that King's primary aim was not to change laws, but to change people. I don't want to burst any conservative bubbles. <laughs> well, you know, maybe a few. But King also said, it may be true that a law cannot make a man love me, but, it can stop, but if it can stop him from lynching me, I think that's pretty important. <laughs> of course King wanted to change people, but from the Montgomery bus boycott to the Voting Rights Act, King always wanted discriminatory laws abolished. Republicans are so shameless in marking King as a conservative, they presented one of his most famous quotes, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation well, they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, as evidence that he was anti-affirmative action. <laughs> no. This is nonsense. King was a champion of civil rights, of the poor and the disadvantaged, of those who have been denied the opportunity to afford others. He wanted the playing field level, and hoped for a day when what mattered most was the content of someone's character. He also recognized that as a nation, we were nowhere near that point, and we still aren't. <clears throat> to read King's words any other way is to intentionally pervert his message with cheap political means. <clears throat> Republicans trying to claim King don't embrace the man who scolded Birmingham, Alabama pastors in 1963 for voicing more concern about a civil rights demonstration in that tinderbox city than the conditions that made the demonstrations necessary. Fast forward to today, and it sounds very much like those who believe that discussing racism is worse than racism itself, if they even believe racism still exists. King never aligned with either political party. His cause was bigger than partisan politics. He was critical of John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson because they moved too slow in civil rights. And had he lived, he would have agitated just as vigorously for President Nixon to further the cause of social justice. He had no patience for anyone 
who passively allowed the obstruction of constitutional rights, and who denounced rampant capitalism and militarism that put the world at risk. These are not noted Republican traits. In the 1967 speech about the Vietnam War, King called the US government the greatest purveyor of violence in the world and was widely criticized for it. In an editorial, the Washington Post wrote that King had, quote, diminished his usefulness to his cause, his country, and his people, end quote. In the months before he was murdered, King launched his Poor People's Campaign to improve housing and jobs for all Americans. Raising the standard of living for everyone is not a Republican goal. They would have ripped King for promoting such a thing. Let's be clear. If Dr. King was still here, he would scorch the blatant racism and divisiveness of the GOP. He would denounce efforts to gut Obamacare, the passage of that horrendous tax tax plan, and every attempt by this administration to weaken laws designed to protect the environment and the most vulnerable above us, about, among us. King a Republican? Now that's fake news. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to reclaim Dr. King. We need his guidance, his vision. His is not a voice trapped in time, it is a voice for all time. A recent New Yorker cover featured an illustration of King, his hands clasped, his head bowed, as if in prayer. His arms are linked with Michael Bennett of the Seattle Seahawks and former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick. And yes, King is taking a knee on the turf. As you likely recall, that's the very gesture that made Donald Trump call NFL players protesting police violence and racial injustice, quote, sons of bitches, and demanded that they be fired. And again, we heard all those questions about timing, and whether a football game was the proper place for such a protest, as if a game was more important than protecting human lives and civil rights. Of course King would have taken a knee, as he would have marched in the streets after the deaths of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, Sandra Bland, and more names than our hearts can bear. He has stood shoulder to shoulder with Black Lives Matter activists and demanded better police training and accountability to protect not just civilians, but our officers as well. He would speak out against the numbing regularity of mass shootings, as well as the inaction of our lawmakers, willing, the inaction of, of lawmakers unwilling to abide uh, challenging the NRA. King would have embraced all who have made this nation their home, the dreamers, the undocumented men and women who contribute every day in this country, and those who enjoy temporary protected status. He'd have rallied against a ban to keep Muslims out of this country. All are now threatened because there is a president who believes to make America great again is to make America white again. And with every muscle, King would have resisted this tweets and tea times presidency. King calls out to us because his dream is not just deferred, but under active assault by this greedy, cruel, mendacious, incompetent administration and its party of GOP accomplices before, during, and after the fact. This is a perilous moment in our nation. Hate crimes have skyrocketed across the country. Neo-Nazis and white supremacists boldly marched through Charlottesville, Virginia last August chanting, Jews will not replace us, and blood and soil a Nazi slogan. A young woman was murdered, allegedly by a racist young man who plowed his car into a crowd of counter-protesters. The president's response was not only tepid, but he spoke of very fine people among the white supremacists. Every president leaves a mark. This presidency is designed to leave scars. <coughs> the current president will go through the motions today of honoring Dr. King and everything King stood for justice, equality, and honor. But all of that is lost on Donald Trump, who has had to say yet again, just yesterday, that he is not a racist. <laughs> Meanwhile, everything he says and does dictates otherwise. These are days when truth and facts are in danger. Let us not lose Dr. King again, this time to a series of lies and cynical misinterpretations that seek to make him into something he was not. And while we're at it, we must find the Dr. King within ourselves. We as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values, King once said. With, with so many of our values under daily attack, what King called the, first, the fierce urgency of now is now more urgent than ever.
Thank you. Feel free, this is the moment of discussion and uh, Q&A, so feel free to direct a few questions towards Renee. Thank you. So what do we do? <laughs> I think being here is part of what you do. I think getting together, I think organizing, agitating, resisting. That's what you can do. And, uh, in, uh, and, oh, me. and voting in November. Yeah. 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 After 2018, this will be probably the most important election of our lifetime. We hear this every election lately, but this, these midterms are going to be unlike any other. Uh, part of a religious movement, we see Boxborough, but I'm sure that all other or many other congregations face similar issues. You have members with different political viewpoints, and, how, and yet we belong to one another. So how do you stay together in this, in this difficult time? Well, I think essentially what she was saying was, when you have a group of people with different viewpoints, how do you stay together in such difficult political times? Um, that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, yeah. it's, it's hard. It's very hard. You know, you either have to make a decision not to talk about politics at all, which is impossible because it's all people want to talk about. But I think you have to be able to hear each other. Yeah. Now, yes, do I want to hear what Donald Trump voter has to say? Probably not. You know. But, you know, if I want you to hear me, I have to be willing to listen to them. And, you know, in my job at the Globe, at the end of every call, it has my email address. And I hear from people. <laughs> and so long as they're not inundated with you know racial invective, I will go back and forth with them. And there are you know Trump supporters who regularly email me, and we will have conversations back and forth and kind of you know check in with each other on where we are. Um, it's a small step, but there has to be a way to hear each other. I think the biggest problem that's going on right now is everyone's sort of stuck in their way, and I get it. It's divisive. It's hard to cross that line. But you know, unless we're going to, you know, go into another civil war, we're going to have to. Um, as a journalist, uh, I'm sure that you think a lot about this problem that people on the other side are reading different columns, different news, watching different <clears throat> internet feeds, and basically believe in different facts than the people in this room. And I find it scary. I'm just. Uh, when I talk with people who support Trump, they seem to be impervious to argument because they have a set of facts that, from my vantage point, are not factual. So I'm curious, uh, from your vantage point, I, I read your column, but shame on me, there's some columns I don't read uh, so Same. much. Yeah. <laughs> I, so I, I wonder how, what you see is the future of this problem of two different worlds of information. Well, no, it's funny, if you watch Fox News, you think Hillary Clinton is president? <laughs> I talk about Hillary Clinton a lot on Fox News. We're always talking about something, and it's just—it's strange. You know, there is this sort of terrible moment of alternative facts, and there are no alternative facts. There are just facts. You know, I don't care how you try to spin it. Two plus two is never going to equal five. It's four. That's a fact. But we're in a time when, right? There's a whole group of people who were willing to believe it's five because that's what they're being told. That's Part of that's a problem the incident. I don't want to be one of those people like, oh my god, the incident is terrible, we should get rid of it. No. But there is a sense that there's, there's an echo chamber. And you can go to certain websites and follow certain people, or friend certain people, who are just going to reinforce your viewpoint. So it's not like, say, when I was growing up and you had, you know, three networks, you had, you know, Walter Ronald Cronkite and John Chancellor and, you know, whoever was on the other station you didn't watch. <laughs> and, you know, and this was the news. The news was a fact. It wasn't this thing that was really open to sort of interpretation. And the idea that everything is open to interpretation is, is really dangerous. And I think, we, you know, you know, I'm not one of these people who jumps up and down and, and says, you know, this is just like Hitler, but it's kind of like Stalin. It kind of reminds me of a lot of Stalin and sort of, the, you know, the idea that the, the government has these facts and this is the way it is. And we've watched it happen, you know, in the last 48 hours of this news cycle since, you know, the shithole countries comment, where first White House didn't deny that he said it, and now there's this narrative of senators who were in the room who first said they don't recall it, and now we're saying it was never said. 
Now, this all happened after Dick Durbin said, oh no, he absolutely said that, he said it more than once. So now you have to decide, who do you believe? Now, if you're smart, in my mind, you have to believe Dick Durbin, because the Trump administration lies about everything. Yes. You know, so if the Trump administration says it, you know what the truth is going to be? The exact opposite. You know? But that's hard to get across. I mean, everything is so polarized right now, I'm not entirely sure how to reach across the aisle, if you will, to not to have people see the world as I see it, but to see the world the way it actually is. Okay, I have a follow-up question about that. Is, um, yeah, I appreciate what you said at the beginning, you know, that, that what Donald Trump said last week was racist and, and he is a racist. And the question about the, the mainstream media is that, you know, a couple days after that story, the Washington Post did a story that said, is Donald Trump a racist? And, and I'm just wondering, as you know, someone who works for the Globe, sort of how the, the sort of mainstream media world handles, you know, not doing sort of just he said, she said journalism, but really speaking the fact of the, the president we have now, and, and you know the, the struggles of sort of telling that truth and not just looking at quote unquote both sides. You know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, th there has been this kind of is Donald Trump a race that we've seen on CNN and we've seen in different newspapers. And the answer to me is, you know, they're really obvious. Like, well, yeah, he is. You know, but this is the same conversation they were having, you know, a year or two ago about is Donald Trump a liar? You know, part of what Trump has done in, in newsrooms across America is force them to answer questions they already know the answers to, but they've never had to put them in print. You know, you're you're really taking a great leap when you have to call the President of the United States a liar. You know, so you hear you'll have misstated falsehoods. You know, it's agonizing for editors to have to say these things. It's agonizing to have to write that the president is a racist. It's not agonizing for me. I'm an opinion <coughs> Want. <laughs> you know, if you're writing, you know, if you're covering Washington, it's a very difficult thing to do. You know, I, I, I think, you know, in addition to everything else, the Trump administration has been a great struggle for the news media to sort of figure out what it's supposed to be. You know, there is a sense that it's supposed to be straightforward in the facts, and it, it can't be a sense of advocacy. You know, you don't want to get into that business, and that's, yeah, that's what, that's what Congress is for. But, I kind of think the rule book is, is being thrown out and torn up right now. And when the president says something racist, you have to call it racist, because that's a fact. If you do anything less, you're kind of playing into the whole Trump mind realm. I just don't think that's where the media needs to be. Thank you. But he, he's also uh, denounced the media with such fury and insulted them and denigrated them. <coughs> But I, I can't see why they wouldn't want to change the game. You know, there's an old expression that you never get into a fight with a pig, mm. because you just get dirty and the pig likes it. Never get into a fight with a pig, you just get dirty and the pig likes it. You know, I think that's the thing. I think the media is still trying to, to take the high road yeah. and trying to not sort of come down to this sort of terrible level but where the Trump administration is, is sort of dragging this country. Um, I, I appreciate the effort. I understand what they're trying. As a member of the media, I understand the need to do that. But they're going to have to figure it out. I think and they're literally trying to they're figuring it out day after day. So when the shithole country, I love saying that. <laughs> <laughs> The president says, so I can totally say it. Um, when it first came out, there was a headline. It was a headline in the Washington Post. And it popped up on my Twitter feed. You know, President Trump calls, you know, nations shithole countries. Mm -hmm. And I sort of tapped, you know, the shoulder of my desk mate. I was just like, oh, oh my God. You have to see this. And so I flipped to the story and I read it. And Marty Barron, who's the editor of the Washington Post, but used to be my boss at the Boston Globe, um, said that they had about a 30 second discussion on whether or not to do it. And of course they did. You know, they had to. And it was interesting sort of watching again the media trying to figure all this out. Like, do we say this? Do we not say this? And MSNBC had S dash 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 hold. <laughs> CNN just had the word. And, and we went to debate the global. Do we put it in? And, and, you know, there was a little bit of debate because, well, it was said that he said it. Do we know that he said it? No, he didn't say it. And if we're wrong. And, 
came by the next day, pretty much most people were starting to use it. But it's, you know, the way that it's, it's a coarsening language, coarsening culture, you know, it's, it's a big decision for me to always figure out what line to cross and, and what's worth it. I think if the president says it, it should be quoted by him. I think it's absurd. It's anything else, it's not, it's not my job to protect Donald Trump from himself. <laughs> That's the question I asked about the question before. Last year, the question was, is, it, is this factual? Is, it, is he tr speaking the truth? It seems like that's been overshadowed. And now, it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. We keep repeating it and repeating it. I'm concerned what you said about mind melt. I'm concerned about we're taking language apart. I'm a storyteller. I care about our culture. And I feel like the examples of what you're putting out, the language is shrinking and shrinking. And, um, so I understand that you have to report what the president says, but there was some count of 2,000 and something lies that have already been said this year. So where I is the? Low, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I that would like to hear a discussion about the morality of where do we stop? Where is it important? Whether it's a lie or it's a truth, and how much right. fiction are we going to live in? It's, a, it's tough, but. It is, it is tough. I mean, as I said, I, I feel that, you know, the media is, is sort of almost making this up as they go along now. There's almost kind of a set of rules on what you cover and how it was covered and, and the interactions you had with, with the White House. And that's not to say that all White Houses were really cooperative. Most aren't. But I don't think anyone's been in a situation before where they, they had a White House spokesperson just flat out lying right. about things. Um, what the media is learned, and, and it's not like the media is sort of growing up, they sort of existed this way for hundreds of years and now they're, they're suddenly growing up, is they're challenging what's being said. They're not just sort of sitting there and, and being spoon-fed as, as much of this as they were sort of early on. They kind of felt like they were trying to be polite. And so you'll have, say, Peter Alexander from NBC News. You know, you've got a group of journalists with cell phones in their hands. If you say something that's untrue, they're going to look it up and call you on it. So you're getting more and more of that. Now, you're not necessarily going to get, you know, Sarah Huckabee Sanders to say anything different, you know, because that's really not what she's getting paid to do by this administration. She's getting paid to lie. And that's what she's going to do. She's there to protect this administration and to not really be helpful to the media. You know, in terms of language, you know, I, you know we had this conversation nationally um, before the election when the famous, the famous uh, Access Hollywood tape came out with Donald Trump talking about women. And there was that debate again. Do you say what is on that tape? I don't think you have a choice. You know, if that's the way this is going to go, I, I just don't think you have a choice. As I said earlier, it's not the media's job to clean things up for Donald Trump. I'm not going to put something in, I'm not going to write the word expletive when I mean something else. I think it's important that people see exactly what is being said. I don't think there should be any gray area about that. Um, is it coarsening language? Of course it is. But, you know, I mean, I don't know, I work in the news, there's not many words I'm hearing from Donald Trump, I haven't heard one for a whole time. <laughs> um, and, but, and, and it's going to get worse. I mean, you know, I, I, when, when the comments came out the other day about uh, Haiti, I, I said to a friend, what, what's the countdown until he drops an end bomb? Yeah. You know it's coming. No one should be shocked, it's coming. You know, the fact that he's managed to get through his first year without saying it, it's kind of a little victory if you think about it. <laughs> but, um, but it's coming. You know, that's, this is who Donald Trump is. You know, this is who his supporters are. They love this. They eat this up. You know, nothing is going to shake them. When he made that comment during the campaign that he could kill someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue and it wouldn't make a difference, that was the one time Donald Trump told, Donald Trump told the absolute truth. He was right. He knew that. We didn't. We're figuring it out. So, you know, I do think the media has an obligation to cover this administration honestly. And at that time, at times that means base language, and that's what we have to do. Comment over here. Um, I think it's important we never stop trying to appeal to the part of Trump's base that might be at you, or as small as it might be. Uh, uh, I'm uh, yeah. 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 sorry. I was just saying that it's important we never stop giving up trying to appeal to the component or faction of Trump's base that might be educable as small as it might be. You know, for example, in 1968, when was the Voting Rights Act? Was it 65? 
<laughs> when that when that was passed, it was passed only because a large portion of Republicans, including the leadership, supported it, supported civil rights and Johnson. The definition of Republican then is very different than today. I think we should remind some of these people who claim they're loyal Republicans all these years that the definition has changed drastically from what it was. And also, even the media is guilty of this. Sometimes they refer to people who are for human rights, human dignity, equal rights, they refer to us as leftists, whereas I, I believe we're mainstream. But sometimes even the media gets into that pitfall of saying people on the left, where they should say the mainstream or, or just the opposition. And this is, this is a phrase that Trump's people use against people who are against him that were leftists. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of this the idea. I, I mean, I appreciate what you're saying about trying to reach the people among Trump supporters who are still reachable. I, I just think they're sort of floating further and further away. And I think what, I, what I'm more concentrated on this moment is kind of saving myself and the causes that are important to me. Because if you think about who Donald Trump is and who Donald Trump was at the beginning of the campaign, he's exactly the same guy. They voted for that guy, and they're loving everything he's doing. You know? Even people who say, well, I didn't vote for Donald Trump, I'm not, because I'm a racist. Like, yeah, but his racism wasn't a deal breaker for you. So that means you're okay with it. And if someone is still supporting Donald Trump now, after everything that's happened, even with policies that will directly hurt them, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of lost on that. I don't, I don't really know how to do that. All I can do, I feel, is sort of fortify the side that I'm on. You know, it's, it's, it's like there's an old song, you know, if you had a choice of colors, what would you choose, my brother? I know what I've chosen. You know, I'm not on the side of Donald Trump supporters. I, I can't be anymore. What, one of the um, things that got me so upset in the last couple of days was that this was a racist immigration policy. These words were said in in support of a racist immigration policy. And the focus on what the word and whether it was said or what word was used seems to be kind of subtracting from the fact that we're talking about a racist immigration policy and implementing it. And I just want you to comment on that. Well, you know, I, I think it's interesting. I said this to someone who um, liked to know that. If you take out the words shithole countries, Everything Donald Trump said was still racist. He was still saying, we don't want these people in the country. Why do we have so many of these people? Why don't we have more? And he did say, Europeans and people from Norway. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and there was a little bit too much attention on the profanity and not everything else. Is, you know, that you know, can't say that. No, 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 no. He could have said it in the most eloquent terms of Not that he could, but he could have said it in the most eloquent terms And it still would have been racist. I mean, that's the basis of this. It's very simple. Let's get these brown people out and get more white people in. You know, that's what Make America Great always meant. And I think probably most people in that room, in this room, recognize that. You know, we knew what he was saying. You know, he wasn't talking about, you know, let's have an America that's more equitable for all, let's have to, he doesn't want any of that. You know, he wants that because that's the world of Donald Trump understands, and that's the world that his base wants. You know, I, you know I, I've often said that when Donald Trump used to talk about draining the swamp, which clearly he hasn't done, but, but what he really meant was, Drowning the people you don't like. And that's what he's trying to do. And I'm curious uh, that the meanings of importance are not taped so that everybody can understand exactly what he said. But that being said, uh, I want to know what how you feel about DACA and the war. Are they bargaining chips that should be what? Um, how do I feel about DACA and the wall, and are they bargaining chips? What I feel he's doing is like, I feel like he's holding these 800,000, however many members are here, 
He's still holding them hostage. Give me this, or they go. Donald Trump's not getting his wall. Donald Trump shouldn't get his wall. You know, something has to be figured out. I don't know what that is. That's, that's not part of my pay scale. But the idea that if, you know, I'll give you Doc if you give me my wall is disgusting. You know, it's blackmail. And I don't think anyone should go for it. It's very really obvious what he's doing. Not to mention, I don't even trust him to, to, to follow through on this. He wants his wall because he told his base they were getting a wall. He doesn't know how to get out of that wall. So he's got to figure out a way to make it happen. And I think the way he's going to try to do that is to attach it to DACA. But of course, his base doesn't want the Dreamers here anyway. They want the wall and the Dreamers gone. So yeah, I, I, anyone who's sort of looking at that as a, you know, an acceptable deal is really fooling themselves and playing right into his hands. His tiny little hands. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I have great admiration for your courage to speak the truth. Last week, the Globe, in the middle of the week, printed a letter from someone who reminded us about George Lakoff, the communication expert. And um, what George Lakoff says is that dictators and despots get reelected because you attack their character and their personality. They'll always win. But if you shift the paradigm to speaking about, the, when you write an article or say something, you speak the truth first, you address the issue first, then you quote the tweet, and you show where the tweet is wrong and not factual, or however you want to interpret that, and then you end with restating the truth and the issue. And that is the way to get control of uh, this viral fake news. What do you think? Is it possible? You know, I, 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 again, there's been a given way that the press and the public have interacted with their president. Twitter has obviously thrown all of that out of the window. <laughs> And so, you know, I can't tell you how many times I walk into the office and we have, you know, TVs all over, you know, sort of hanging from the ceiling. And you walk in and you'll just, the first thing you see is a tweet from Donald Trump and you're thinking, oh, what now? <laughs> you have to deal with it. You know, if, if, the, if the old, again, what I said before, the old rules have to be kind of thrown out and how you deal with these things. So. If Donald Trump says this in a tweet, well, it's easy to check the facts. You know, you investigate it, you see what's true, what's not true. Usually it's generally easy to tell what's untrue. Um, and then that's what you report. You can report the tweet. And people keep saying, well, stop writing about his tweets. You can't not write about the tweets. And I, I hate to say that, because sometimes he's doing nothing all day but tweet. You know? But when he says something like he's going to ban transgender men and women from serving in the military, and that comes through in a tweet, or he says something really irresponsible about North Korea, I don't think at this point the media can afford to not do it, because that is the way he communicates. He's not having press conferences. You know, occasionally, you know, he'll be at his resort, of course he's always at a resort, he'll be at some resort and he'll see a couple of people and he'll have a comment, but he's not just doing the kinds of press conferences we saw in past presidencies. So, you know, this is, you know, this is kind of how he communicates, but, you know, the media has, knows its job. You have to still check it out. You still have to investigate. You still have to call him out when he's saying something that is blatantly untrue. Well, I think it, the idea is that you don't, it's not that you don't quote the tweet, it's that you pick, you pinhole and explode it to look and open it up and look at where the truth is, where the lies are, where the issues are, and where the racism is, whatever it is. Yeah, the good thing with Donald Trump, it's all on the surface. <laughs> you don't have to explode it that much. It's all right there, you know? Um, and the media will do that. I mean, there's, there, you know, when you sort of ranting about Hillary Clinton, sometimes those are just trying to ignore it because that just feels sad. I don't even know what that's about. But when he's saying something about North Korea, or he's saying something about DACA, or um, transgender people in the military, or something like that, then that's a story, and it's covered accordingly to say, you know, you know, when he says that, you know, 
transgender military, they're a distraction. Well, you can go and find all the surveys that said, no, they are not. You know? And you know, when he says this about, you know, well, you know, undocu undocumented um, immigrants have caused this percentage of crimes in America, there's stats. You can go find that. And that's what you write in your story. So, you know, you can, you can meet him every single step. But again, in that so funny way with Donald Trump, you know, he's not, he's never talking to the media. He's talking to his base. Everything he does, he does by the base. Because, you know, his numbers are falling so quickly, that's what he's got to hang on to. So, you know, that's why I don't believe him on DACA, because he knows his base doesn't want those people. I'm wondering what you think about the role of uh, comedians in this, and I've been amazed at the uh, level of rhetoric. Anyone who watched Saturday Night Live, you know, they held the punches about this stuff and saying it is. And do you think that uh, impacts maybe a part of the population that is a you know, that was reading your Oliver is sitting here? You know, it's a boom time for comedians. <laughs> you know, comedians and, and, and cartoons. You know, if you, if you want to get some of the best stuff being done about this administration, follow an editorial cartoon. If you're on social media, follow an editorial cartoon. They've been absolutely fantastic for this. Um, you know, I think the comedians are in a sort of a weird place. Comedians always become politicians. But this is something else. There's a sense that there's a lot at stake. So occasionally when you watch um, Stephen Colbert, you know, or you watch Trevor Noah, there's almost not even humor. You know, they become the audience. They're just reacting to what's happening. And then occasionally there'll be a kind of a punchline to it. But I think what they do is extraordinarily important because, you know, they're helping to kind of burst this bubble. They're, sort of, they're taking Donald Trump on in a way that media really can't, um, which I think is, which is, I think is hugely important. Um, you know, it's, you know, if you're trying to get away from that, then I guess you watch Jim Fallon, right? But, you know, generally, you know, everybody has to do it because it's all people are talking about. And if you can't have what's going on in this administration and then settle down at 11 o'clock or 11 30 and expect them not to take it on. And I think they can do a fantastic job. Stephen you know, Colbert has been out in the wilderness for a while. So he found his voice with all the companies. Jimmy Kimmel on healthcare. Jimmy Kimmel on healthcare. I mean, who knew, right? I mean, you know, here was Jimmy Kimmel who was seen as being, you know, just a sort of jokey guy. and. You know, when he was doing stories talking about his, his son's illness and, you know, the fact that he could afford to have care for his kid and how people can, I mean, he's been doing some really serious issues, you know? So I think it's been fantastic. The same with Saturday Night Live. You know, the thing also to remember is that Donald Trump watches all of it. You'll never believe him when he says he's not watching this stuff. He does. And he's affected by it. And because even though he'll say he doesn't watch it, he will then tweet something that directly relates to the fans that he doesn't isn't watching. You know? So, you know, it's, it's, it's worth doing. It, puts, it, you know, it kind of keeps him on, I don't want to say it keeps him on his toes, but it keeps him on notice that he's being watched and people are critiquing him. And if they're critiquing him hard, it's a lot of people. It's the only way to deal with this. Well, I mean, whoever becomes president next time we're going to do it. We're kind of past that at this point. There's, there's no rehab in the presidency. It's the only power in the White House. Um, as for kids, I wrote a column about this, I think, last year. Um, as with everything else, there's been an uptick in, in hate crimes. And what they've been finding in schools nationwide is that Donald Trump's name is now an epithet. Meaning people will just chant Donald Trump, Donald Trump at kids who are Mexican or kids who are black. You know, they will say, you know, well, when we build the room, when the wall is built, you won't be here. You'll get this work. It's happening in Massachusetts, it's happening in California, it's happening in every state. That's the effect on you know, to the point where, you know, there are kids who were afraid. It happened at a high school where there was predominantly black basketball team and people started chanting at them, saying, Trump, 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 Trump. Trump. They're not chanting because they love the president. They're chanting to intimidate those kids. And the kids don't want to go back and play there. So that's the impact on all Trump's 
you know, I'm, I'm not a man. Um, and so I do talk to him, and he said, I'm not going to all teenagers now. And, and they've never cared about politics. I mean, they're teenagers. They're doing they're teenagers. But all they want to talk about now is Donald Trump. You know, but they also want to talk about the fact that they can't wait until they can vote. <laughs> So many different people who said, I've never done anything like this before, but I felt that I had to be here. And I think that's really important. You know, people realize that sitting at home is not going to get it done. You know, things happen before when you don't like them, you say, oh, that's terrible. But people feel like they have to actively be out there doing something to so stem the tide of what's going on. And, you know, however people do it, whether you do it, in your places of worship, whether you do it where you work, you know, <laughs> people are difficult about that sort of thing, but you have to do it, you know. Go online, you're, you're, you know, I know people who have like sort of support groups. Um, so I think that's just really important. You can't stress enough. You know, there's nothing that's too small that won't make some sort of difference. You know, again, you know, the midterm elections are coming up. Just voter registration, help people with it, get out there. There's lots being done. Um, there's, there's, there's no time to sit on the sidelines anymore. You know, silence is complicity at this point. Mm -hmm. I think the question that you asked about what can we do? I think that in this room, as I look around and I am one, we are all aging, all of us. And if you think about it, 12 years from now, so add that to your age, think about the fact that there are going to be 20% of us in this country that are going to have power. And so this is the time now, while we may be as well as we are, to do something about what is going to happen in this country. And if no other stance we take, if those balls go up, who, who in this country is going to take care of three out of four of us in this room? And we are going to need that care. And if you stop and think about who in this country takes care of other people, it is those people that often are not invited from the other side of the room. So that we can do. We are getting older, it doesn't mean we can't. <laughs> 